Hey everybody, Gray Stallman here. I'm your host. This is live with, uh, I'm totally TOA. lost now, live with TOA. Um, um, Golly, I got a whole audience over here that's making me nervous. Um, the doctor's in live with TOA. I get it. Okay, um, how you doing? It's Monday. That means we're in Murfreesboro. This fresh young face here is Dr. Lucas Ruth, and we're going to talk to him about a, in just a minute about uh, outpatient joint replacement. It's like the whole new thing. When I was in training, everybody was in the hospital for a week to two weeks, and now we're sending people home the same day. It's pretty incredible, and he's going to give us some insight about why that is, how it works, and uh, what are the advantages. So uh, he'll be here in just a sec. But as with all of our uh, videos, please make sure to understand that while he and I are fellowship trained orthopedic surgeons, we're not your orthopedic surgeons. So please do not assume that this is medical information. This is for educational and information purposes, maybe a little entertainment purposes only. If you have a musculoskeletal problem, uh, go seek out a professional. Go to toa.com. You can learn about our practice. You can learn about our physicians. You can learn about the services we offer. You can even make an appointment online. Uh, we have a ton of uh, video information in our um, media center uh, talking about a variety of topics. All the old uh, Doctors in Facebook Live uh, adventures are online. So please go to toa.com and let us help you get rid of your problems so we can get you back into your lifestyle. Anyway, without further ado, Dr. Lucas Ruth, um, he's probably our newest shareholder. He's, he's young, but he's experienced, and um, I'm looking forward today to talking with you about yeah. uh, joint replacement. So Absolutely. give me a little idea before we start talking about our topic about your you, yourself, your training and whatnot, yeah. and what your interests are. So I've been with TOA now for about two and a half, almost uh, three years, um, and from the southeast, kind of nomadic throughout the southeast, um, did my medical school training at Wake Forest, um, uh, trained in uh, orthopedics down at UAB in Birmingham, and then did a year of um, uh, fellowship just outside of the D.C. area with the Anderson Clinic, and during that time, we really had an emph uh, emphasis on uh, rapid um, recovery protocols, outpatient joint replacement, and so that's kind of been uh, near and dear to my heart uh, as I've come into uh, practice. I'm here in the Murfreesboro location 100% uh, of the time um, and do kind of the wide gamut of joint replacement from primaries to revisions, but outpatient joints have been kind of my uh, biggest uh, uh, focus of interest. Yeah, it really is a big topic. Um, Nobody wants to spend time in the hospital. I always tell my patients, um, you don't want to be in the hospital. That's where sick people are. And our surgical patients typically are not sick. They're recovering from surgery. And so um, one of the big advantages of outpatient joint replacement is staying out of the hospital for an extended period of time because there are bad things that can happen. Absolutely. You know, I mean, infection is just kind of, the hospitals are harbingers for infection, especially now with the COVID pandemic, we're a year into it. And so you've got that and being able to get in and out of a hospital in an efficient manner, but in a safe manner um, is uh, um, a very important thing. Um, and, you know, actually the, the studies are coming out that the results are even better for outpatient joint replacements. Um, you know, one component of that might be that the healthier uh, patient is more likely to be selected for an outpatient uh, joint replacement, but a lot of practices have transitioned almost exclusively to outpatient, and so it can be done appropriately in the wide variety of patients. Now, typically, joint replacements have been done in the full-service hospital, the big building, um, and that's where I imagine a lot of the outpatient surgery is still done. You come into a hospital, but you don't stay in the hospital, you go home. Yeah. People are also doing uh, joint replacements in the ambulatory surgery setting, surgery center setting, which is truly a freestanding, outpatient-only facility. Are there really... Are there differences? Is there a different patient population? No, so I think a lot of that has been politic. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, training in um, the D.C. and Maryland area, outpatient joints at the ambulatory surgery center were just as common or more common. Um, in Tennessee, it's been a little bit slower to progress, but 
What we do from an anesthesia standpoint, from a surgery standpoint, from a physical therapy standpoint, is no different one facility to the other. You're not getting a separate product or a different product, but the ambulatory surgery centers are just more fluid, efficient machines and are able to do it a little bit more uh, successfully without as many glitches uh, and have turned out to be a, a very safe option. You know, as you mentioned earlier, um, 20, 30 years ago, a joint replacement was a two to three week ordeal where you came in prior to surgery, you, got, you gave blood in anticipation of requiring transfusions that occurred almost every case, and then the recovery protocols were very uh, drawn out. There have been a lot of changes, not really from a surgical uh, standpoint. We do have better instrumentation that allows for more fast, rapid surgery, but anesthesia has been the large driving um, part for outpatient joints. The kind of discovery of the different pathways of pain from the site of surgery to the brain and being able to target uh, using less narcotics, but uh, being able to target that with multimodal pain, um, doing regional anesthesia or spinal anesthesia uh, in combination uh, with um, conscious sedation has meant um, better perioperative pain control, lower blood losses, um, faster recoveries, and then um, with improvements in the implants, we can now get you up and moving a lot quickly. We don't have to worry about uh, the implant being any sort of um, limiting factor. And so all of these uh, things have changed uh, kind of gradually over the past 20 years and have really made for a successful outcome. Now, so in general, um, the big joint replacements, so big joints are knees, hips, shoulders, ankles, mm -hmm. any others that I'm missing? Elbow is kind of a medium-sized joint, yeah. and then the fingers, hands, toes types of stuff. Um, can you can do any of the big joint surgeries as an outpatient? Absolutely, given the right circumstance. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, with a with a hip replacement, and I don't do ankle replacements, but those are done under tourniquet, and so that minimizes um, blood loss, which used to be a big. Um, uh, issue with joint replacement as uh, far as keeping patients in the hospital. With hip replacements now, um, in addition to regional anesthesia, there's medicines that we can give, one called tranexemic acid, um, some people call it TA or TXA, and that has been very revolutionary as far as reducing the amount of blood loss during these big joint surgeon surgeries so that we can reduce blood loss, which thereby reduces blood pressure issues, reduces nausea issues postoperatively and allows for us to mobilize you really quickly. And so um, shoulder uh, replacement, who some of my colleagues uh, do that, uh, hip, knee, ankle, all of those are safe. Yeah, you mentioned a little bit ago talking about when, when I was in training, we it was a week-long affair in the hospital, that almost everybody donated blood in anticipation of a transfusion. As I know now, we hardly ever transfuse somebody anymore, right? Yeah, for a, a, a primary joint replacement, I would say probably less than 0.5% uh, of, of patients. Um, you know, certainly we want to do our homework. So as, as someone recommending joint replacement, we want to make sure that we optimize uh, you prior to surgery and make sure that you're a good candidate. You don't have significant medical comorbidities, heart disease, lung disease that might make it uh, more difficult to uh, have outpatient surgery, but certainly make sure that we don't have any blood issues, any anemia or low blood counts um, prior to surgery that might have an adverse effect. And so that um, may be something to have a conversation with your treating surgeon to see, am I a candidate? Because we want to set you up for success as, as opposed to failure. And a lot of that is making sure we've got all our ducks in a row prior to surgery. The surgery itself is kind of the easy step. That's the last kind of exactly. hurdle. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so obviously, um, not everybody is a candidate for an outpatient procedure, but increasingly more and more people are. Is that about the way to look at it? I would agree with that 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Now one thing, um, way back when, um, when I used to do knee replacements, we always put a drain in somebody and there was lots of drainage for a long period of time. 
How do you manage a knee replacement, for example, and drainage? Are there tools, techniques, things that you do differently? So I can't remember the last time I've used a drain, to be honest with you. Um, you know, drains um, have largely been uh, abandoned in the arthroplasty world because they actually contributed to increased transfusion rates. Uh, this medicine, tranexemic acid, has been really the game changer for it. Um, what it does is it stabilizes the formation of blood clot, and so it doesn't, I mean, if you cut a vessel, that's going to bleed, but as um, bleeding occurs, the blood will congregate and form a clot. This medication stabilizes that clot, and as a result, we've noticed reduction in um, bleeding during the case, but also afterwards, because it lingers within the body as the body continues to uh, heal up after the time of surgery. And so I haven't had any issues with um, significant post-operative drainage or uh, any need to take back uh, patients to wash out a hematoma uh, that we may have seen 15, 20 years ago. Are there differences in one of the big things about joint replacement, especially knee replacement, is post-operative rehab is really important to get the best function. Are there changes or differences in how you approach therapy, rehab, since they're not going to be in the hospital um, so, to do that kind of thing? Yeah, so the biggest thing with joint replacement, kind of like what we were talking about as far as optimizing you from a medical standpoint, is we also need to make sure that we have our whole plan set out from the beginning so that you walk in, you have the knee replacement, but everything else is already set up. Oftentimes, we will schedule a prehab appointment where we get you in with a physical therapist uh, ahead of surgery and they go over some expectations, but they will also kind of delineate some exercises to be doing right away. Um, we still um, will have you work with a physical therapist, whether it's done at the ambulatory surgery center or the hospital after um, surgery in the recovery room and they give you some exercises. Um, but a lot of us will go ahead and get physical therapy set up, we'll have your walker already available have everything in, in motion so that it's just kind of a seamless process to, to get that going. Uh, you made the comment, you know, physical therapy for a hip replacement versus a total knee replacement are, are two separate um, animals. There's a lot of literature now that's coming out that for hip replacements, especially done from the anterior approach, um, now don't need formal physical therapy. Uh, we're seeing uh, equal results with or without it. A knee replacement, though, um, we as surgeons do the easy part in replacing the knee. A bulk of the outcomes of knee replacements are then on kind of your shoulders as the uh, patient to really get it moving. A joint at rest is going to stay at rest. And so pushing through the pain, um, being diligent about working on motion is critical uh, for uh, improved outcomes. Yeah, I think from the shoulder guys world too, they would agree with the same thing. Yeah. Shoulder rehab is really important to get the best benefit out exactly. of this exactly. big operation that you're committing to. Um, again, like you say, we do the easy part. Yeah. The hard yeah. part yeah. is yeah. all on the patients yes. <laughs> with yes. a little bit of luck and a little bit of fighting off Mother Nature. So yeah. um, let's see. So I, I just for you guys' information, I had a joint replacement. I had my hip replaced done almost three years ago. And it was an outpatient procedure. I had a spinal, so I couldn't feel anything. I, I elected not to have any sedation whatsoever, so I was completely awake and alert. And I'm a little weirdo, but the reason why I did that is because I know what to expect. Yep. I knew everybody around me. I knew the noises, sounds, smells, and I, I, it didn't bother me. But I'll tell you, I finished surgery. I got back to my room. My spinal wore off in about two hours, and I was home two hours after that. Yep. And didn't need any therapy. My therapy was walking in the neighborhood, and after the soreness went away in a week to 10 days, I'd been on Tylenol most of that time. Um, it, it's been awesome. Yep. And uh, I think more and more people are seeing that same result rather than the slogging of people in the hospital for days and days and days um, that yep. we used to do. Even um, 10 years ago, uh, in practice watching the guys, people were in the hospital three or four or five days. Yeah. We just don't need that. The patient doesn't need it. Correct. Very, very right. And then, you know, one of the biggest things, and I think the most important takeaway from this is 
The key to success is preparation, but on part of you as the patient is having an advocate for you at the house, okay? You know, the expectation that you're going to have surgery, not having any pain, you're going to be back doing all your activities within a couple of days is unrealistic. Okay, we do have these abilities to control pain and do so safely, but you will need somebody to help you with the day-to-day -day activities for the first week to 10 days uh, to be able to help you drive to therapy so that you don't miss out on that. And having a good patient advocate, family member, close friend, um, here in the South, a lot of church members uh, to help take out or take care of you is probably the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, I've always advocated that for the spine yeah. patients too. It just makes little sense for people to undergo a big operation and then essentially shortchange themselves by not being prepared. Yeah. Um, these are big operations, even though they're outpatient, even though they're slick as can be. Taking off somebody's joint, taking out somebody's joint and putting in metal joint is a big operation and it's traumatic to the body. And so um, there ain't no laser surgery when you're talking about joint replacement. Um, and the same thing with spine. And so it really is incumbent upon people to take the responsibility to have their team in place at home. You don't have to have babysitters, but you need to have exactly. somebody who can help you because it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be hard. It's going to be sore for a little while. Yeah. And even though it's outpatient, doesn't mean that you still haven't traumatized the body. That's, that's the Mother important. Nature has to has to be playing a role too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, pain has also been the, the biggest thing that's changed for any outpatient surgery, your spine, sports, joints. And you know, the anesthesiologists have done a great job of figuring out the pain pathways um, and, you know, we're able to do these surgeries now and really limit the amount of narcotics that we're giving because of these multimodal pain treatments. So we're able to target pain through Tylenol for anti-inflammatories, a small component of uh, narcotic pain medications, some nerve medicine, and, you know, while they don't seem to be that effective in unison, but together they have this combined effect and have really also uh, helped to shape uh, recovery. And without the side effects of the opioids, which are really problematic, and that, um, let alone the whole concept of dependency, it really exactly. is the nausea, itching, uh, constipation, mental um, effects of those yep. drugs that are really, that's what People have more complications as far as length of stay and whatnot related to those things absolutely, than any other. Absolutely. Narcotics can also increase pain, um, paradoxically, in some patients. And then the anesthesiologists have uh, different uh, blocks that they can put in to numb up the nerves for 18 to 24 hours. Um, we have um, cocktails that we can inject into the joint itself that help to uh, mitigate pain during those uh, first uh, 24 hours and so that all has uh, really improved uh, patient pain levels which thereby has allowed for faster ability to work with the therapist getting mobilized. What's your experience been over the last couple of years, three years or so, where this has really become even increasingly popular in Middle Tennessee? Elsewhere it's been popular for a lot longer. Um, how are the insurance companies, the payers, the people who pay for the uh, uh, procedures, how are they coming on board? Are they all for it? Are the, is there a variety of different payers uh, with different levels of interest? You know, that's very much a regional uh, conversation. You know, in D.C. and Maryland, that had already um, been um, played out pretty well and negotiated um, appropriately for years. Tennessee's been a little bit uh, behind the ball uh, with it for whatever reason. I can't really pinpoint that. Um, but we've made really good strides in the past couple of months um, working with the hospital systems, uh, working with the insurance companies uh, to negotiate the contracts. Because if you look at it, the price of a joint replacement from an insurance standpoint is dramatically lower at an ambulatory surgery center than that at a hospital. Um, and so insurance companies are now um, getting on board with it because, you know, you don't want to slouch on quality, okay? 
and we've proven through uh, many years and many studies that the quality is there. Um, and so I think they um, checked that box and then now trying to um, make uh, surgeries done at ambulatory centers um, more um, readily available uh, is beneficial for them um, from a monetary standpoint um, and then also from a patient from an outcome standpoint. And so it's it's working, it's been a slow process, but it's uh, one that's um, moving in the right direction. And kind of the Mac Daddy of all insurance payers, Medicare or CMS, they're on board with this, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that typically, um, uh, commercial payers kind of follow the lead of Medicare. And so, because Medi Medicare is always very good at protecting the patient. Yes. But if they deem that um, uh, it's safe and effective, a procedure or process um, and they say okay we check off on that the other insurance plans typically tend to follow suit pretty quickly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and and again the 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 die has already been cast it's 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 safe and so now it's just a matter of changing some of the stigma associated with it uh, in certain states um, from this 10 to 14 day to now a six hour uh, process and so the insurance companies have been able to see that uh, mm -hmm. is successful uh, and, and is now really changing changing the landscape of arthroplasty surgery altogether. So, kind of last question: Where do you see this going? Um, uh, have we have we gotten to our limit of this, or um, what's got, what's out there that may? lead us to even more rapid recovery types of procedures? You know, I think we're doing a great job. There are some surgeons um, that uh, I have trained with and um, are doing almost all joints now as an outpatient. There are even revision surgeries that are occurring on an outpatient basis. Um, and, you know, I think every time we uh, establish uh, a procedure, um, it t there's a break-in phase, and we have to make sure that it's, it works, it's vetted out, um, but then you start to not push the envelope, but you try to start testing new things to see if they can be done safely, and so I think that uh, joint replacement, for the most part, will largely become an outpatient-only uh, type procedure. You know, these ambulatory surgery centers are also becoming equipped with a observation-type uh, unit, and so if there is any sort of um, um, hold up um, and with joint replacement that typically is nausea um, for men um, urinary retention issues um, or uh, blood pressure issues if, if you need another 23 hours to kind of be teed up before going home these facilities are also having those capabilities and and that allows us to do a little bit more as well yeah so outpatient doesn't necessarily mean you get kicked out of the facility that same day it can right. outpatient can actually go over a midnight and yeah. still be considered an outpatient so Correct. it's yeah. not we're kicking patients out that don't need us um, well thank you that's awesome um, uh, it's exciting stuff I think it's great for our patients yeah. um, I think that uh, the surgeons are definitely on board with it I think the patients for the most part once they get over the initial kind of anxiety in some cases are all for it because nobody wants to spend any time in the hospital yeah. and um, it makes financial sense for the hospitals and the surgery centers now that the insurance payers are, are going for it so it's exciting time we're seeing the same we've seen the same revolution in spine we're probably a few years ahead of total joints in many of the spine cases um, uh, again old man here talking we used to keep a discectomy in the hospital with a six inch wound in there for three or four days and now it's a one inch wound and it's two hours yeah. so you know i think that's the wave um, we will continue we as a, a orthopedic community will continue to follow patients and and do studies to make sure that we are not harming people um, uh, and it's the best thing for the patient so i think that's what what this is all kind of come from yeah, and, and that's the biggest thing. You know, all of this is science-driven. We're not just having these cowboys uh, yeah. just doing it. A lot the of first guys is, were cowboys. Yeah, this is this is all very much guided by the literature and guided by successes and uh, reported literature uh, to be safe. Um, and so, uh, I think uh, that has panned out very well.
Awesome. Well, again, Lucas, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. Great. Uh, please, uh, if you have another topic you'd like to talk about, I'd love to have you back on. Um, uh, people out there are kind of voraciously interested. We have this core <laughs> community of people that are like stalkers. It's kind of cool. Um, but anyway, thanks again. I appreciate you. Thanks for having um, me. Everybody, um, once again, um, go to toa.com. You can learn about TOA, about our mm -hmm. practice. Our, uh, we are the oldest and I think now the largest uh, practice in Middle Tennessee, if not the state. Um, that's a good thing. Um, and uh, we have lots of information on our website that you can uh, look at online, stream uh, videos of various topics. Uh, you can learn about our practice, our offices, our services, and uh, so go out there. If you have a problem, we can probably help your problem. So um, uh, anyway, thanks for watching. Come back. We don't have a specific date yet for another um, uh, episode. Uh, we may be switching back to the Fridays for second quarter. Um, uh, we'll see. But uh, we'll let you know. Keep an eye on Facebook. Keep an eye on our YouTube channel. And keep an eye on our other social media outlets. And we'll uh, get that next information to you. But uh, anyway, thanks again. Go out there. Live your best life. Have a great weekend, buddy.